podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Purinita, and I'm a leadership consultant with Inspire One. And I welcome you all to Inspire One's last of the three series webinar on building leadership capital, implementing successful development plans. As a process, leadership development is about firstly, assessing talent to identify development goals. Secondly, charting out the development plan. And thirdly, implementing the development plan for successful achievement of development goals. In our first webinar, we focus our discussion around the business importance of identifying a high potential and building human capital by establishing clear development goals, which were aligned to the organization's objectives and individual's aspirations. Having set the goals, the next step was to create a development plan to achieve the goals. In our second webinar, we discussed how to create robust individual development plans based on different levels of leadership and on the 70-20-10 framework, which is a mix of education, experience, and exposure. In today's webinar, we'll be focusing on the process of implementation of the development plan to ensure successful achievement of business goals. In this webinar, our endeavor will therefore be to understand how to seamlessly integrate the various elements of education, experience, and exposure towards meeting the measures of success. Identify possible derailers in the implementation of development plan. Understanding the key success factors in implementation of the development plan and sharing of some best practices by some of our client organizations on factors which have ensured successful implementation of these plans. Before we proceed, let me take a few moments to introduce you to a few things. In order to make this webinar a co-learning and sharing opportunity, you can use the text chat feature at all times during the webinar. For minimal disturbance during the course of the webinar, we'll request you to keep your lines on mute. We encourage you to send your questions as you have them. We will try to address as many questions as we can during the webinar. Alternatively, we will get back to you with the answers over email. Today's webinar is brought to you by Inspire One. Inspire One offers leadership and organizational development solutions to inspire business performance by transforming an organization's most valuable asset, the human capital. In the past, Inspire One has supported many businesses during their business transformation through multiple solutions and through many initiatives in the leadership space. Our speaker for today is Mr. Deepak Mohla, whose experience consists of a dynamic mix in both the corporate and consulting assignments across industries. He has focused his efforts around organizational behavior and change, top team management, succession planning, and executive coaching. I will be in conversation with him to leverage his experience in the area of human capital development. We welcome you, Mr. Mola, to this webinar, and thank you for giving your time to speak with us. Thank you, Varunita. In our last webinar, we discussed how the various elements of the 70-20-10 framework are carefully selected to design a robust learning journey for leadership development. In our experience of developing leaders over the last 20 years, we have designed many leadership development solutions post the creation of an IDP, where we identify the elements of the 3E of the 70-20-10 framework, which are applicable for the leadership development of, uh, in the journey. It is based on the requirements of the clients, organizations, logistical and budgetary constraints, and maintaining a fine balance between the Puritan and the reality. Once these elements are selected, these elements need to be seamlessly integrated into a free-flowing learning and development journey so that the business objectives are achieved and the development goals are met. Based on some such considerations, we had designed a learning journey for one of our clients from the consumer durable and electronics industry. This intervention was created for the mid to senior managerial level leaders based on the same principle of 70-20-10 to enhance leaders' capability in the current role as well as to prepare them for future roles. 
The design of the journey consisted of webinar sessions which set the context of the workshop, three workshop sessions which were face-to-face -face classroom sessions, job shadowing and coaching sessions. Learning integration was ensured with the help of critical business projects undertaken by the participants. Constant engagement with the participants, publishing of weekly dashboards on project movement, connection between the webinars and workshop sessions, involvement of supervisors and internal coaches, regular connect between the project teams to ensure proactive project management were some of the few success factors in the implementation of this particular project. So for the successful implementation, I believe it is critical to integrate the elements of development into a seamless and blended journey where one element seamlessly flows into the other. What are some of the key factors to ensure that the development initiative is an integrated approach? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Paranita. I think you've covered uh, one critical element, which is in the design of the whole journey. Uh, very often I find that uh, we get carried away by what looks good and what sounds good. So we try and put in everything which we possibly think will have a positive impact. And we disregard the process capability of the organization to be able to you know, successfully conduct that. Uh, to give you an example, uh, we've been in situations where a client had a, uh, a batch of, let's say, 100 high potentials or mid-high potential people, and they want to take them through a nine-month-long development journey. Uh, it sounded very good, and I think we packed in with a lot of options which were available, uh, which we thought were relevant for the client based on our pre-work, etc. And we did check with the client that uh, for the project implementation of this nature, there's a significant amount of resource availability required internally, uh, both logistical, uh, intellectual, and physical. And most importantly, the focus of the management. Uh, and what I found was, and as we had apprehended, that not even midway through it, we had to make some major changes to ensure that the project does not you know, kind of meander away. So to me, the, the most critical part is be true to the uh, resources that you have and the commitment which people have to the successful implementation of a project. So what may look very good, and what you call, uh, talked about as creating a fine balance between a puritanical approach and a real practical approach. And I think the real practical approach in my mind always takes precedence over puritanical approach. Somehow a lot of our friends in the HR fraternity get carried away by what looks good, what sounds good, but what may not actually be able to look good and deliver good on the ground. So I think that's the first uh, important fact I would say is be sure that whatever you're creating as a design is likely to get implemented. So that's number one. Number two is the accountability. Who is accountable for the successful implementation? And invariably, uh, you know, again, uh, the HR team takes the onus on itself that oh, we are responsible, which truly they are. In a way, they are responsible for ensuring best resources are available for the participants when they go for their development journey. But I have a different point of view. I think the onus lies with the individual. So if it is a high potential, then the high potential must be very strongly development-oriented. And development starts with the self. Right. So if I take accountability for my own learning and development, to me, that is a very, very critical factor that I am responsible for my development. I think the second factor, which, uh, or the third factor, the first one of the design, second factor was, uh, is the accountability. The third one, which I think is the aspect of continuity, right? How are we able to build one uh, subject into the other? Like to take one element into the other. Now, uh, you know, we may, so what, they, what we may call as building blocks. So 
you may start with something which may be a great workshop and then for a long period of time there is no you know there's a long gap or you may follow that up with an immersive exercise which may have nothing to do with the what have you have covered in the workshop so it sounds good and as individual efforts they are great but they are not one in, you know as kind of integrating one flowing into the other so whatever you have done in the workshop as it were is moving into the second one give you another example we've done assessments you know most organizations and most of our journeys have a, some kind of a psychometric assessment or some leadership assessment at the early part how is that integrated into the learning design and is it flowing from that feedback to the design of the workshop to ensuring that there is a continuity and there is a relationship which is built between the individual assessment as well as what is going to be discussed at the workshop similarly when you go into the next coaching or whether it's a group coaching or individual coaching how is that picking up the threads from the workshop taking it to the next level where people have tried some of these aspects what they've learned in the workshop and applied them and then they come to the coaching session to say okay guys i've tried this and this one worked for me or this one did not work i did some problem solving and this is really what worked for me and there's a group sharing or there is a one to one coaching whatever the solution has to offer i think we need to provide for after each element some application it's very much and i think today's uh, you know focus of the millennials on their learning style uh, it's a bite sized learning and with application and i think we must follow that a concept whether it's high potential at this junior or mid or senior levels learn and apply learn and apply that's when it will becomes a part of us if we just learn but do not apply it will you know fritter away so i think giving a strong element of application is a critical part followed up by coaching so that their people can learn from each other's mistakes and from my own mistakes and i am able to understand why it worked something worked and something did not work i think so that aspect of continuity building blocks becomes a very critical uh, element uh, as well the fourth element is around the uh, aspect of involvement of my uh, management team uh, if i was to put it in the scale of 1 to 10 if the management team is not involved with the high potential development i think it's a non starter it's like a sine qua non without without this better not get into a high potential development it is not an hr exercise alone i i want to emphasize that it is a initiative led by hr but the success of that is not dependent on the hr function it is dependent on the overall leadership so i encourage very strongly that please include the high potential development journey as one of the review item of the mancomp so which is the management committee meeting or whatever as a monthly review or a quarterly review where it becomes a standard item of review that okay we have taken this initiative where are we on it how is it going what is it that is blocking it or what is it that is going so well what else can we do to make it better and i can give a number of examples both for and against it where it succeeded with management involvement i can uh, uh, you know give the example of one of uh, a large one of the largest global mnc's in the chemicals business and the fact that we were able to succeed with a batch of 70 people over a nine month journey i think i would give uh, the unqualified success totally laid at the doors of the leadership team because they were very committed to it despite the fact there were major challenges from the global headquarters or the regional headquarters they stuck to their game and they ensured that this was a high degree focus and eventually when it succeeded it became a big point for the india team or the indian geographical team to share with the global team that look here on our own we did something and we were able to make a big success of it and that i think is purely the commitment of the management the leadership so that's uh, another uh, critical factor which uh, comes to my mind the last but not the least is uh, each person is uh, individual has i have my own uh, 
you know, issues, the way I, I deal with learning. Someone has a different way of learning. And so you may call it learning abilities, you know, my what pedagogy works for me, what does not work for me, my learning style. I think we need to be a little mindful, especially when we are talking of the high potential. And which means that uh, understand each person's, because for nine months, 10 months, 12 months, we are going to be working with a batch of a group of people, right? And uh, we must understand each one individually and not just put them as uh, a group, batch one, batch two, and so on and so forth. Focus on the individual, see what are the uh, idiosyncrasies the individual may have, what can help him or her, and work alongside with that. So I think these are the five, six things which uh, are critical to the, you know, the development journey. Um, so I hope that uh, gives some inputs to uh, you know, the participants and uh, uh, to the HR fraternity that the six elements which are, according to me, what has helped us and what has not helped us in some of the uh, journeys that we've had with our clients. So you mentioned design to be the first key element uh, to ensure successful implementation. So if the, the design has to be robust. So while we have the plan in place, that further on breaking down into the design of the journey needs to be built up. So, so you mentioned all these points. So while we take care of all these points, and we also mentioned about uh, I mean, uh, bringing a fine balance between the reality and the Puritan uh, uh, that is there. So. Uh, while we are designing the journey, what are while there are so many things that we should keep in mind, or so many things that we should ensure are in place while we are uh, uh, implementing the journey, but are there some basic uh, thumb rules that definitely must be followed so that uh, these has to be in place so that the design for a strong design design foundation to be in place? Are there any thumb rules for that? Well, one of course is the seventy twenty ten principle. Your design should be high on the. Uh, you know, experience and exposure and not necessarily focus on the classroom workshop, which are critical from knowledge sharing point of view, but they are by themselves limited in how much change can be produced, especially when we are talking of behavioral and leadership development uh, initiatives or competency development initiatives. But I think, as I mentioned, so take each element. So if it, I would say, like, uh, take a child, for example, and you want to him or her to you know, build up a certain capability of forming small sentences. So how do you build that up? You start building with certain alphabets, then words, and then you know, slowly and gradually you start building it up and you help and talk to the child in a certain way that he or she starts talking. But if there is no feedback, right, I think the growth starts getting retarded. So I think the feedback is a very inherent part of the uh, whole process, which means as many touch points as we can have. So in today's uh, virtual world, it's not necessary that I have to be in uh, physical proximity with the person. I can be in virtual proximity with the person as well. But I must have as many touch points as possible. I think that's what I have found to be a very a critical factor in the design. So a design must include many touch points. A design must also provide for different ways of learning because when you're looking at a batch or a group of 20 or 50 or 100 people, as I said, each person will be different. So provide for it. So ideally, as I said, there could be one for each person. But that's what I call a puritanical approach. So that's not possible. That's utopia. So what is possible is you try to put them together in some form and which has similar capabilities. Uh, some kind of homogeneity you try to build up. But even then it's not possible. So what you need to do is to ensure that there is a variety of learning experiences and people can pick and choose. And some way I may get a 20%, somewhere else may get 80% out of it. But there may be another situation where I'm able to do that. So if I am not able to work in the classroom or at the workshop in a master class, I'm not able to draw so much. But in a coaching, I can, or in my working, I can. So provide for all those experiences, which, are, which means at the end of the day, all of us have got equal opportunities of learning. And I think as uh, good project managers for this, where the HR can play a big role, is to have those checkpoints to ensure how each individual is doing. And the best way to ch through check through those checkpoints is actually through the project work which people are doing. 
and you can see how much of the application is actually happening. And if it is not happening, then ensure that it gets picked up at the coaching sessions so that people are able to then build that capability up. So I think this is some of the thing which uh, in, the, in the design, I would say, uh, become kind of a building block step by step. Don't go from one step to step X and then come back to step uh, L. So that kind of, a, you know, like a duck, you don't know where it goes under, where is it going to come from. So it has to follow a certain logical process of building up the capability. And number two, having as many touch points as uh, one can and so that there is opportunity for feedback and then having multiple ways of uh, you know, uh, learning. learning. So we have a question from the audience. Uh, this person says, we are currently conducting an intervention for our high potential leaders. These leaders have been identified uh, to take on the next role at national as national level leaders. Our current journey is a blended learning solution consisting of immersions, workshops, and undertaking uh, of business projects, uh, which are of next level role importance. Would you suggest any improvement or additions to it? But we don't have much context of it, but probably you can give some suggestion to this person if there can be any improvement. No, I think I like the idea that <clears throat> what is espoused here is of the next level projects. And I think that's an important uh, uh, input I would like to share with the larger audience. Is that if you give me something to do which I'm capable of doing, then it doesn't really excite me and I, my learning is limited. I think all our learnings come through our challenges. Uh, so give me something which is challenging. I remember when I started and I dare say it continues to happen with good organizations even today. So one of the early, day, early things which a manager training goes through is attend a board meeting. So one is to expose him to what happens at, at a board meeting. And so, and of course, is the aspirational part. But the other is the inspirational part, that you also get inspired by what is happening. So I think a, a certain amount of uh, sketch is definitely required. Uh, I would also say that, uh, you know, the, the, these are uh, the person who's asked this, uh, uh, shared this uh, particular need i think they've covered everything as what one can it's, you know it's a standard thing which you want to do i think what i would say is how do you ensure management involvement or leadership commitment in this how can you visibly put it there have you organized something at the start of the journey is any of the senior leadership members going to be there to set it off give the context or why is it important to the organization I think that's a critical part. The second part, which I think from purely a participant would be, so what happens to me? What is in it for me? So development is great, right? But where does it lead me? And I think companies have started looking at some aspect of relationship between career development and individual development. And it's a fact that the two are related, but uh, most organizations tend to keep the two unrelated because they see one be giving a kind of a commitment that if you get developed in this and you will move into the next level. So the person passes that and say, okay, so now what? And the organization may not necessarily have an opening at that point of time and that leads to some kind of attrition. So those are realities of life too. But at the same time, I think we must be clear that as a participant in that journey, I also want to understand, so where does this take me to my aspiration, towards my aspirations, towards my career goals? And I think if we can build that up in the narrative, it will be great. And that's where the leadership team can play a big role. I think that's, these would be my couple of inputs on the limited context that uh, the question has. Thank you, sir. Uh, so my next question is that uh, to ensure that uh, the business goals are successfully achieved, uh, you mentioned uh, the six, seven points on design, on being accountable, on continuity of the journey and having robust coaching and project management and uh, focusing the learning journey on the individual capability and aspirations of the uh, aspiration of the person. Um, but sir, in implementing this, can you help us with your experience? What are the possible challenges we face? What are the challenges we should foresee, uh, be ready for and... As a HR fraternity, they should cater for that time-wise and both budget-wise. You know, it is like a life cycle. 
so whether it's uh, this uh, journey is also like a life cycle. So you would have a product life cycle, you have an organization life cycle. So there is high energy when a product is launched. There's a high energy in the organization when a new department is launched or the new organization is launched or a product is launched. But then very quickly, it the energy starts whittling down. It's very true for something like this, for a development initiative. So there's a great energy at the start, right? You have a, uh, you know, Takeoff program and there's a huge degree of vitality and energy. You're looking at a nine to 12 months to some cases even 18 months journey. You want to retain that energy level at the same point as it was at the beginning. And that is against odds. All the odds are against you because the, journey, the energy levels will go down. Uh, routine would take over. My exigencies of business would take over for the participant. So everything actually goes against the learning process, right? And moves into the operational process. And hence, for this particular initiative, the energy levels go down. As an HR manager, it is my bounden duty to ensure the energy level is maintained at a high level. One of the big challenges. So how do you do this? How have organizations done this? And I dare say there is no uh, real solution that, okay, this is one solution which will fit everyone. But what does help, and that's what some of the points I mentioned, is having as many touch points as is possible. Having constant reviews with my supervisor. If it is not of interest to my supervisor by what I'm going through, very quickly, my interest will also go down as a participant. My supervisor must show that interest, must review with me. And hence, if I'm working on a business project, which is important, it is important for the supervisor as well. Now, you know, a lot of organizations are now finding that when they look at the supervisor's KRAs, right? So whether you call it the balance scorecard or any other mechanism of performance management, there is a good amount of weightage companies have now started giving to the role of the supervisor in developing the team members. But quite a lot of it is still on paper. In practice, it does not happen. And why does it not happen? Because when it comes to the supervisor's review, that last item on development probably takes a short shift. Or the weightages may be so low has to be not of great sequence or consequence. So we all say that a great leader is one who creates more leaders, but when it comes to the whole aspect of putting together, we may lose track of it. So how do you ensure involvement of the supervisor is one of the big challenges for the HRT. And that's why if you can ensure that it comes into the review process of the leadership team, so the Mancom is reviewing it on a monthly or a quarterly basis, so what is important to my boss's boss will become important to my boss. Maybe I'm putting it crudely, but that's the way the world works. And hence, I need to ensure that that process is in place. But will that by itself sustain it? Maybe not. I think there's also an element of if something good is happening and if you can recognize it, I think it gives motivates you and it motivates the rest of the team. There is a mechanism through which people are watching what is happening. They are seeing what good is happening. They are recognizing it and maybe in some cases rewarding it as well. <coughs> so reward and recognition then becomes a very critical part. And so when we work with clients, we uh, ensure that involvement of the supervisor in the journey Ensuring that the supervisors are aligned to the journey. <coughs> also ensuring that they know how to supervise those, how to give feedback for those uh, in the whole initiative, so that we are all working in concert for the development path. Uh, communication is the next one which I would look at. So there was reward and recognition, there is the supervised involvement, the leadership focus. <coughs> And then I think I would look at communication. Uh, communication is the lifeblood of any such initiative. How we can never over communicate. 
And when I say over communicate or under communicate, so companies and have found a great ways of doing it. Uh, some of our clients, for example, gave the whole initiative a very aspirational kind of a uh, positioning by giving it a name, right? Someone called it the Senate, someone called you know gave it. I remember having worked for a media company, and uh, so they took all the top Bollywood stars and gave them the, the name to each of the participants who were given one of those names. And so because they were in that business, they could relate to it, they could work towards it, and th that for them was a great way to communicate with each other. And so when we created the final communication package for them, all of them got you know, uh, great uh, theatrical uh, kind of awards. So you create your own uh, lingua franca, as we call it. You create your own persona for that brand of the program. So you create a like a, a live creature. That whole initiative becomes like a live human being, a live persona with certain characteristics and certain attributes. So people start relating with it, right? Start imbibing those values which that persona has and which you want through this journey to happen. And you keep on communicating on a regular basis. So you have WhatsApp groups. So some of those, the technology allows you various options, right? Pick up those options and use them effectively because people love to learn from each other. And I think the millennials, uh, without technology, they would find it difficult. So you use their technology, their language, and help them to create that uh, uh, common forum for communication. Last but not the least is the whole aspect of governance. And uh, I kept it for the last because it encompasses almost everything that I've said into this. So in a governance process, what do we say? We say that, okay, this is a project which must have a strong governance process in place, which means there must be a project manager. There's inevitably be a project manager, let's say from Inspire one side, inspire one. And there'll be a project manager from the client side. The client is the project manager, is responsible for ensuring that this whole initiative succeeds with whatever measures of success have been identified. So there is a whole process behind that. And then there is a project sponsor. Who is sponsoring this initiative? Is it the CEO or the functional head or the business head? Whosoever is sponsoring this must be very clearly defined, which means the sense of accountability, which I spoke about, is the accountability is not just of the participants. Accountability is also of the supervisors and eventually the sponsor. The sponsor is underwriting a certain expense of time, effort, and resources. He or she has to ensure that this succeeds. Right? If there is no sponsor, the chances of success get diminished hugely. The project manager is the person who's going to be working under the sponsor to ensure that this project goes well. So there's a clear project plan with clear deliverables, clear milestones, and which it means there are you know sponsor meetings. So if I'm the sponsor in some of the uh, the projects, I would meet with the sponsor from the client side. Together we will meet maybe once in two months to see how things are going. Because he can take care of some of the issues there are. He can simply just you know, take uh, wipe them off the table. And since there are no problems, similarly at our end also, we can ensure that no resources are not available if they are required to be made available. So it takes away the, you know, the entire uh, problem of the table and ensure that the focus is purely on development. If any course corrections are required, because things do not necessarily always go as per plan. We are able to do that. And then at the end of the day, when it comes to, so what have I achieved? What is it that I have done? So companies call it various names, and we may call it, for want of a better term, a certification. So at the end of the day, a certification, and as I mentioned, I think I may have mentioned in one of my earlier webinars, um, and the gentleman is extremely well known in the media today, the, the financial services, one of the tallest leaders that I have known. Uh, he spent two full days uh, reviewing the projects of each and every 40 participants who went through that journey. Finally, there were 35 or 36. He spent two full days, and you can understand what the impact of that would have been on the participants. 
He was there for the certification. He was ensuring that he was here. The question, he was genuinely interested. So it was not that question that he had the uh, showing interest. He was genuinely interested. Because he spent that time, very clearly you could see that the whole organization followed the leader and create, created a very positive learning culture. And I think that's what makes a true leader, someone who's able to create leaders under them. And so certification to me is a very critical part. It's, clo it, it's like closure of a project, closure of an initiative. You must bring things to a close. Otherwise, it's the open-ended thing which keeps on happening. So how do you give that certification? I think over the years, we have found various ways of our organizations working with them. We have also learned and evolved. And I think recently we had a case with the escorts and we covered a large number of people. And I think I, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you probably are going to be sharing something with the client, with the client who's uh, done on certification. But I think it was a huge success. They created that certification and linked it with career development path. That was, I think, a wonderful way of doing things. So I would encourage this aspect of uh, certification. So these are the very many things which organizations actually do to ensure that uh, the projects and the initiatives give us the maximum returns. So from an individual's perspective, to keep the energy levels high and to keep the motivation high, uh, you mentioned either reward or recognition or a robust certification process could be helpful. Communication as well. Communication as well. Uh, rest of the things more or less are, are dependent on the organization or the HR's initiative, be it uh, uh, the supervisory alignment or constant engagement. But from, for the individual to, you know, uh, be forthcoming and be uh, learning open, it, uh, these are the two things, three things that needs to be managed, the motivation level and the energy level. So if certification, reward and recognition and communication uh, drive it, what are the uh, so elements of certification or what are the parameters on which the certification is to be given? So if how can we define it right at the beginning of the journey so that you know participants are driven right from the start? So how can we do and ensure that? Yeah, so I think it's a very good one, very good question for Anita. And I again would say, uh, caution everyone, please don't look upon this as a standard response. You'll have to create your own certification um, you know, parameters, as it were. But what we have found through experience and sharing from that is that, one, the parameters must be known to everyone before you even, at the time of announcement, right? That there is going to be a certification, and the certification will be based on these parameters, and the weightage of each of these para parameters is this. Second part, if these are the parameters, how are they going to be evaluated? As objectively as possible. And how often will they be evaluated? And who will evaluate? I think those are the things which need to be very transparent because you are now actually putting in writing a kind of the whole performance of the actions of the individual over a 12-month journey. And it could have a bearing on how he, his career shapes up. So it's very important we do it with a degree of diligence and a huge degree of transparency so that the person buys it. And number two, ensure that there is uh, visibility of that process to the individual on a regular basis so they know where are they going. And so they know that what makes good looks like and what do I do to achieve that. So one, of course, would be to say that, okay, at the start of the journey, am I clear about my goal, the clarity of my goals, the quality of my action plan, the IDP, et cetera, what we say. How well have I thought through it? The choice of the project which I have taken up. How have I been able to get the buy-in, right, and the commitment of the organization, et cetera, towards that? How well have I thought through the various actions that I need to take? So one is the project related, the 70% exposure. Have I got myself clearly defined? And have I got the measures of success, right, for each? If I've got the measures of success for it, then obviously they themselves, so it's very, one part of it is very strongly around project related. And if it is something which is uh, a business project, so the, the, the parameters are known. Number two is 
most of the uh, starting or the end objective is not that the business goal of the project should be met. It is really that uh, you know the, the behavioral aspect of the change. So it is not to say, okay, the business end of the uh, projects have been achieved. It is really to say the competencies which I was to develop, how far down that road have I really been able to achieve that, right? Which means if I was, uh, the competency was, let's say, of strategic thinking, how I have I been able to develop that at the level of competency or proficiency that I wanted to have I been able to achieve that, right? So that's the second parameter. One is the business objective, second is the behavior or the competency. And how does that get come through? It may not come through only through assessment. A lot of it comes through supervisory feedback, right? It comes through also the feedback of the individual coach. Right? So how does the coach feel that the movement has been happening? And so the constant feedback and the movement on proficiency level, let's say from two, the person has moved to three, or from three, the proficiency level has moved to four. And those examples are made available to the person to say, okay, this is what you, we see the movement. And you can see the impact of this behavior, that this competency, the impact of this competency now is X, Y on your project and on your output, right? Now that's a big movement. That's really what you want to. So. Obviously, the person is able to see the benefit of it and he's also see what good looks like. So it's not something which is done very subjectively. Then there are aspects of uh, you know, the coaching sessions. How is the person actually using those coaching sessions? And that's very much driven by the coach. So these inputs are coming from the coach, how the person has worked on the, pro on the project, on the, on the, between the coaching sessions, what are the kind of issues he's bringing to the table, the kind of understanding he is or she is having of the various competencies, how he or she is applying, right? So all that becomes another factor which either supplements the movement of the competency as well as the person's own keenness to learn, right? So those are the, some of the elements which uh, can be done from the coaching sessions. And then finally at the workshops, at the master classes, the involvement, the, you know, the kind of a participation, the kind of value addition the person brings to the learning, not only of himself, but of the larger group. So there are weightages given there as well. And then how is the person able to share, to motivate the rest of the team, kind of collaborative activities which the person engages. So you can have n number of attributes which you can look at. So if someone is working with any industry body, has that person been able to create a research paper? So you can see, Paranita, there are many, many possibilities which one can. But as the ingenuity lies really in being able to do it beforehand, be very transparent, right? And be very objective. Because that's some, and so I have many examples to show why you see this person is at the level where he or she is. Thanks. So as you mentioned, we have been fortunate to work with many organizations across industries and who have successfully implemented very complex uh, learning journeys for the development of their leaders. Um, we would be sharing uh, one such uh, audio clip by our client from uh, from Escorts, who have shared uh, uh, their successful implementation and they have, uh, you know, attributed it to their certification, robust certification process. So before that, I would like to give our audience a context to the Escort project that we undertook. So the Escort's leadership development journey was a completely role-based assessment uh, journey for the sales and services of the regional uh, level managers. And uh, the role themes were identified at the beginning and uh, competencies were defined both functional and behavioral. It was a completely blended learning solution with assessments, workshop, digital learning, team application projects, group co coaching, and the certification process was based on uh, evaluation of each of the various elements of the journey, uh, the workshop, the digital learning, team application, group project, and they were evaluated on each level and uh, certification was uh, uh, divided into uh, various levels and people who qualified to a certain level 
and uh, in their performance conversations that was included and based on the certification level they were the next step in their roles decisions on the next step or next uh, role advancement were taken so we would like to share our client's perspective uh, on this process Hi, we recently worked with Inspire One for one of our projects for our sales and marketing businesses. Um, this was basically a role-based certification for specific critical roles uh, in the sales and marketing function. Uh, while we were trying to finalize this journey, one of the key elements that we discussed was around the certification criteria. So basically, uh, we uh, were able to uh, categorize our people into four categories, uh, silver, gold, platinum and diamond based on the scores they, they would achieve as a part of the journey. And this uh, actually became a very critical input for the overall performance discussion of these employees. So I think as a part of journey, if we have clarity with respect to how are we going to use that data towards the end and while we are finalizing the performances of these individuals, the categorization of the performance criteria actually played a very important role. share our client's perspective any other example of our client who must uh, who have for whom some certain other factor might have been uh, become one of the key success factors yeah i think uh, the communication piece i think for one of the um, you know, large insurance companies, uh, life insurance companies, when we work with them. Um, I think the way they went about doing the branding of the organization, uh, of the whole initiative, you know, the first time they were launching any such initiative, so they said, we want to give it a very strong aspirational brand. Uh, they created the brand, they made big announcements of that, they put that across all their branches in the country. The people who were attending that, they were, you know, kind of put on a pedestal. So it was as if I put my stake in the ground. So the moment I put my stake in the ground, then there's no going back. So if I, as a zonal head, I'm going for that, so my team members are going to ask me every time, so boss, how was it? Every time I go for intervention. So I had no escaping from it. So it was a very high degree of visibility they created, very strong branding they created. They put a very strong values behind that. And they kept on bombarding with and number of things which were happening on the various projects which people had taken up and made a big announcement of that. They kept on announcing whatever major milestones were being achieved. So now as a participant, I wanted my name to be also seen because my team is suddenly seen that we don't want a boss who is not, you know, with it or not involved with it. So perforce, I was also now getting pushed by my team members to do more. So it became uh, like a team versus team to see which is the one which is moving faster in the learning. So the whole process, it became competitive too. But it also created that energy because competition creates a huge amount of energy. And that's what we wanted to be sustained. So I think that helps that communication of competitiveness, of saying that this is what is happening with A, B, and C. This is what the milestone they have been able to achieve. So that creates a very positive thing. At the end of the day, we put that all into the first time we did that, put into a coffee book and Gave a, gave a very strong branding, gave a one page to each of the participants of that coffee book. So they were thrilled. So each one took a copy of that because that was a huge certification for them. They look at this is what we've done over the last uh, uh, nine, 12 months period. So a very well thought out communication strategy. It is not left to chance. So we actually work with the client and say, okay, about a half day, and with their marketing team or the communication team and say, okay, so what is the kind of internal communication package or internal communication strategy or internal communication plan we would have? At what frequency, how would we do it and so on? So sometimes we miss out these nuances and it hits us. It hits a learning journey. Thank you, sir. So we have one small question from one of our audience. Uh, he mentions that uh, they had conducted a large-scale leadership development journey for the first-line managers. 
Uh, since they had to ensure scalability, they had kept the journey fairly simple with the workshop sessions and learning projects. Uh, however, he mentions that the business impact of the program was not as much as expected. Uh, could you suggest if uh, it was an implementation failure or could, could it be a failure in the design? Uh, so I think firstly, we would, I would like to understand what were the expectations of this initiative? Because success or failure has to be measured against your goals, right? The design is coming from the goals and not the other way around. The goals don't come from the design. So they would be very clear. What do we want to achieve? If it's a large number of first time managers, uh, what was the expectation? What did you want to achieve? And if that was to be achieved, then you have to look at the design and say, was the design appropriate to achieve those goals or not. If it is not appropriate, then the issue is with the design. But if there were no goals set, then I think the first fallacy actually comes there. How do you measure success? So from my point of view, I always would believe we start with what do you want to achieve? And you may want to achieve the moon, right? But that's when I come to the second part, right? Are you in a utopian world or are you in a real world? then you have to see what are the resources required. If you're going to create a big journey for 200 people and you expect that each one of them would improve on their competency or on the behavior or on their business impact by X, Y, Z, but then that may not be feasible unless you deploy a huge amount of resources and manpower behind that. So I think the measures of success are the first thing. How am I going to measure the success of this? And then you work backwards and say, okay, the design will be this. For this design, do I have the resources? Right. So that is where the fine balance, which I think you mentioned when we started looking at the design. So design is a function of what you want to achieve. It's a function of resources. And that's a fine balance. So I would be say that uh, the success or failure one uh, uh, person should measure, uh, measure against the goals which were set. Thank you, sir. I think in this webinar, we have understood how the implementation of a leadership development journey is dependent on certain key factors, which is the design of the intervention, the organization's responsibility under various factors, measured through various factors, like supervisory alignment, uh, communication uh, robustness, and various other things are essential to ensure that the le learning implementation is done as per planned. The self, which is the key heart of the learning journey, the person who is going to undertake the learning journey and implementation of the learning journey is successful only and only if the learner receives the knowledge towards achievement of the development goals. So I think it's essential that the self is motivated the self is always energized and the self takes ownership of one's own learning. Thank you, Mr. Mola, for joining us today and sharing your knowledge, expertise and perspective on building leadership capital. I would like to close today's session by a quote by Aristotle. For the things we have to learn before we can do them, we learn by doing them. A plan is a plan till it is executed well. And when the implementation of a development plan is successful, the leadership journey serves its logical purpose, which is ensuring business results. I hope as learning and development professionals, we are able to facilitate this process and take it to its ultimate conclusion. Thank you all for joining us today and being a part of the leadership building process. Thank you for joining us and being a part of all the three webinars that we conducted under the umbrella of Building Leadership Capital. We appreciate your participation and thank you very much.